we just pray our father in heaven we thank you so much for this wonderful time that you've given us lord just to remember who you are and what you've done for us is so overwhelming and uh, we pray father that as we spend time with your word we pray that your presence would be with us your spirit would help us to understand what your word tells us what the lord jesus told his disciples when he was here 2000 years ago and we pray that we would not just listen and understand but we pray that we would hide these things in our heart and uh, appropriate them in our lives lord we uh, we are conscious lord that we have only one life to live and uh, that the most appropriate thing is to live it for your glory and only what is done for you is going to matter and count in the end and so help us to be conscious of these truths as we listen to your word in the name of our lord jesus christ we pray uh, last time we looked at the conditions that the lord jesus christ lays for discipleship um, he, he expects supreme love from a disciple he expects disciples to deny themselves and he expects disciples to take up their cross and uh, we saw that these are extremely stringent or these are extremely uh, severe demands but at the same time we also saw that these are absolutely logical demands they are absolutely reasonable demands because given who he is given who the lord jesus is and given what he has done for us nothing is too big to offer to him so what he offers us is in keeping with reality that's what we looked at now if someone has counted the cost of these of discipleship if someone has looked at all that jesus demands and says yes i would like to be a disciple of jesus christ then uh, what is the kind of life that such a person will live that's what we look into right now so uh, let's read uh, this verse that we read uh, yesterday today our focus is on the last part of the verse matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 yeah deny himself take us take up his cross and follow me uh, last time we also saw that the meaning of the word disciple is a student who is also a follower someone who is learning to follow the footsteps of his master so jesus is now saying that true to the meaning of the word if you are going to be my disciple then you should be following me uh, what does it mean to follow jesus uh, it does not mean follow him in trivial things like jesus had a beard so i should also grow a beard jesus used to wear tunic so i should also wear a tunic that's not what it means to follow the lord jesus but it means to follow him in those aspects which he put forth in front of us as crucial there are some things that the lord jesus said is crucial that he did and he wants us also to do and that is what is meant by following the lord jesus christ so we look at some of these aspects the first aspect that i want to consider is the obedience to god's word Uh, the steps of the lord jesus on this earth were directed by the word of god and that ought to be true of his disciples so we look at some things uh, in the life of the lord jesus with respect to the word of god could someone read matthew chapter 26 verses 53 and 54 yes so this is uh, what the lord jesus said when he was going to the cross and his disciples were trying to defend him they were making a clumsy attempt to defend him and prevent him from being crucified but he's saying that you know i'm going willingly if i wanted i could prevent all this from happening to be but then how else can the scriptures be fulfilled so as the lord jesus was approaching the cross he was doing what he was doing with this desire that his life should fulfill the scriptures in all respects then a little further luke chapter 23 was 34 the last part luke chapter 23 was 34 the last part of the verse yeah so these are the sta- this is a statement jesus said father forgive them for they know not what they are doing this is what the lord jesus said just after the cross was lifted up when he was put up on the cross he said father forgive them now probably he had this other passage in mind that is isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 if we could turn to it just a few words that are crucial to our point right now can you find something relevant there in isaiah 53 12 yes he made intercession for the transgressors isaiah 53 talks about the sufferings of the lord jesus and it says that he made intercession for the transgressions transgressors so this is a prophecy written 
uh, more than seven centuries before the time of Christ. And when he's on the cross, he's doing exactly that. He's asking forgiveness for those who have crucified him. Then uh, John chapter 19, verse 28. Yes, this is at the end of the time of the cross. Uh, the three hours of suffering were over. And now he says that the scriptures might be fulfilled, I thirst. So there's a reference in uh, the Psalms which speaks of uh, the suffering savior being thirsty and being given gall and vinegar to drink. So what I'm trying to point out here is from the start to the end, the Lord Jesus' life, his actions, his words were directed by the word of God. And if we are disciples of Christ, then our lives, our thoughts, our words and actions also ought to be directed by the word of God. Now, you cannot obey God's word. Uh, you cannot obey God's word unless you know God's word. So, when we say that we must obey God's word, that implies an effort on our part to know and to learn God's word. Uh, shall we turn to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 7? Yeah. If you had known what these words mean, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You know, that is a small sentence from the book of Hosea. And the Lord Jesus is quoting this verse from Hosea to the Pharisees. Uh, the reason for my taking this right now is to point out the knowledge of the scriptures that the Lord Jesus had. I mean, uh, would you and I be able to quote a verse from Joel or Amos or Hosea or Obadiah just like that while talking to somebody? That's what the Lord Jesus is doing here. And uh, it's very easy for us to say that Jesus was the son of God, so he is God, so he knows everything. Um, but we must also remember that uh, Jesus never used his divine omnipotence for his personal benefit. So he was a man, and he was a child, and he was a teenager who grew up. So he learned things like all of us do. So I'm trying to point out here that if the Lord Jesus Christ knew the scriptures, then it is also our duty to make an effort to learn the scriptures. Shall we also look at another example? Luke chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Yeah, yeah, that's enough. So it says the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to the Lord Jesus. This is happening in the synagogue at Nazareth. When Jesus went to the synagogue, he stood up to read and they gave him the scroll of the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah was one scroll at that time. And uh, Jesus found the place where it is written that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me and so on. That's actually a quotation from Isaiah chapter 61. You know, Isaiah is one of the biggest books in the Old Testament. It has got 66 chapters. This is chapter number 61. Um, the chapter divisions were made by a person called Stephen Langdon. That is in the year 1200 or so. So during the time of Christ, there were no chapter divisions. So, imagine your Bible, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, no chapters, no verse numbers. And you were asked to take to that passage where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach good news and so on. Uh, the Lord Jesus was turning. That, that scroll has to be rotated and rotated and rotated. And he kept rotating it until he found this point in the scripture where uh, you know, he, he got the text that he wanted to preach on that day. So what I'm trying to say is, without these aids that we have today, without even chapter and verse numbers, the Lord Jesus knew the scriptures inside out. And uh, therefore, it is our duty also to take an effort to study God's word. Uh, maybe we won't read this verse, but um, in Matthew chapter 22 here, uh, we see that the Pharisees and the Herodians and Sadducees, they brought a lot of controversial questions to the Lord Jesus. Is divorce okay and is taxes okay and so on. So every controversial question was settled by the Lord Jesus by referring to the word of God. So as disciples, we also have dilemmas in our life. Whether is this right, is that wrong? Um, should I do this way or that way? Every question, every controversy ought to be settled by referring to the word of God. That's what Jesus did and that's what we also ought to do. So I would uh, strongly encourage all of us, that uh, we don't rely just on the messages that we hear from people, but in our own private lives, we ought to be spending time reading and studying the Bible. Uh, when you read the Bible, don't just uh, 
read those parts which you think are going to help you you know i read the psalms because it encourages me but i don't read leviticus because it's all about animal sacrifices don't have that kind of attitude all scripture is inspired and if god included something in the bible it means that he wants us to know it okay so read the bible from genesis to revelation all the parts of the bible uh, you know today we have this uh, uh, in in the circles that we live we have this practice of uh, there's a lot of verses that people share on the internet on social media and things like that and it's good to read verses on the go you're traveling and somebody has shared something on whatsapp if it's a bible verse well and good but you cannot make that your mainstay are you getting what i'm saying you know you cannot survive on chips you cannot survive on soft drinks so in the same way a disciple cannot survive just because you know there's a verse written here or somebody sends an sms with a verse you have to read the bible systematically on your own uh, right from beginning to end then um, Uh, the bible is not just meant to be read but it's meant to be studied as well now uh, there are two types of tools that are available to study the bible uh, on the one hand we have uh, say a commentary you know what a bible commentary is you familiar with that then we have uh, sometimes we have study bibles and uh, in the study bible sometimes you have uh, an explanation given of the passage Uh, sometimes in a study bible at the start of the bible you have an explanation at uh, the start of the book you have an explanation given of the book now all these things are well and good but uh, what we need to learn to do is to graduate from these kind of tools to another kind of tool and the other kind of tool that i'm talking about is say for example a concordance or a software that enables you to search for a word or a dictionary these are tools that make you do it yourself are you understanding the difference so i have john chapter 1 in front of me and i have a commentary which tells me the explanation of john chapter 1 okay there's nothing wrong in that but what that is doing is somebody else has studied john chapter 1 and he has got some insights and he is telling it to you but it would be better if you read john chapter 1 on your own and then you you look at all the verses that are there the words that are occurring repeatedly you know this word occurs here in john chapter 1 does it occur somewhere else so you use a concordance to find that there's one term which is difficult to understand so you lo- use a dictionary to find it out in this way you're studying the bible on your own you're not just taking the food that somebody else has cooked and given you okay so as disciples of christ as we mature we need to graduate to Uh, studying the bible on our own uh, developing our bible competence our knowledge of the scriptures on our own okay by mistake i put the picture together okay so this is on the right is the picture of a man and on the on the full screen is actually uh, this man being tied up on a stake so does anyone want to guess or does anyone know who this could might who this might be sorry yes it's william tindale uh so william tindale was the first person to uh translate the bible directly from greek to english uh before him wycliffe had translated from latin to english but uh, uh tindale took the original greek manuscripts the greek new testament and he uh translated it to english and had it printed and uh, because of this because the ecclesiastical authorities were against the bible being in the hands of the common people he was tied up he was condemned to be burned at the stake but the executioner was a little sympathetic to him so he strangled him and then his body was burned so the reason for uh, my taking this example is this that uh, you know the the bible that we have in our hands today we have it because there are people in the past who have given their lives for it there are people in the past who have shed their blood for it and that is why we hold the english bible in our hands and we got to value that we cannot take it lightly we got to value the bible that we have and the bible that people have struggled so much to give to us how fitting it is for us that we should study it cherish it and not just benefit from it ourselves but also pass it on to others 
You know, the Bible is the best-selling book in the world, but how many copies have you and I sold? These are questions that we should think about. Uh, the Lord Jesus valued God's word, and so should disciples. On the same lines, I'd like to show a short uh, video. You know, the, uh, this video challenged me because uh, it shows the love and the excitement that these people have for getting the Bible. And we have so many Bibles with us and so many tools to study the Bible, you know, but uh, how much are we using them? Another aspect of um, a disciple's life is that a disciple would live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we won't read this verse, but uh, Matthew 12, 28, it goes like this. It says that uh, the Lord Jesus says that I, by the Spirit of God, am casting out devils. So the work that Jesus did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, this functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit is closely connected with another uh, idea, and that is operating according to the will of God. Uh, as unbelievers, we operate in our flesh. We operate according to our own desires. And as believers, we have both these natures. We have the fleshly nature, the old nature that we inherit at birth, as well as the new nature that we inherit from God when we are born again. And both of these are there simultaneously, and sometimes they are fighting against each other. And sometimes as believers, we give in to the flesh, uh, whereas sometimes we give in to the spirit. So a disciple ought to be operating in the spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, and operating according to the will of the Father. Uh, why is the guidance of the Holy Spirit needed? Because the commands in the Bible are general, but the only way we can fulfill them are specific. For example, the Great Commission says in the Gospel of Mark, preach the gospel to every creature. Now, can you and I go to every creature and preach the gospel to them? No. This is a command given to the whole church. So, what is my part in that? To whom should I preach the gospel? I need the guidance of the Holy Spirit to obey such a commandment. Um, elders are commanded to feed the flock. Feed the flock means to teach them God's word, to nurture them with God's word. But which part of God's word to preach when? We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit for something like this. Uh, we also need the power of the Holy Spirit because what we want to do to people is actually supernatural. You know, I can prepare my notes and I can study God's word and I can take a flight or I can drive down and come to Bangalore and speak here. But then the real work that needs to happen in your heart and in my heart, uh, that only God can do. And that is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are doing something in the flesh with only our own abilities, then ultimately it is futile because it does not serve any supernatural purpose. Genuine Christian work is supernatural. For a person to be born again when you share the gospel with them, that's something supernatural. For a believer's life to be transformed, that is also supernatural. And these supernatural things will not happen unless uh, what we are doing is guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, speaking of the will of God, uh, how will you find the will of God? A lot of the will of God can be found just by opening your Bible. In the Bible, we see something that some things that God wills for all of us. Uh, I'll just uh, take up a couple of things that God wills for all disciples. One of them is separation from the world. Uh, can anyone help me on this? What, any thoughts on what, what is the meaning of separation from the world? Be not conformed to this world. That Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. Anything else? Anyone else wants to say something? Sorry? Yeah, we are set apart. We are not like the rest of the world. We are set apart from the world and therefore we should also not be conformed to them. Which means uh, our life should not be aligned according to their life. Our way of thinking, our way of operating, the language that we speak, the things, the way we use our time, the way we dress, the way we speak, these things should not be aligned along with the world. You know, once um, someone was uh, saying like this that, you know, we shouldn't, um, you, you know, we shouldn't dress this way to church. And then someone replied like this that, no, but in our office people dress like this, so it's okay. No, but I'm trying to say that that's a totally wrong way of 
reasoning. You can't say that something is okay to do for us or for God's people or in the company of God's people because people do it outside. Uh, that's a totally opposite way. It happened even with the people of Israel. God wanted them to be separate from the nations. And on one occasion they asked a king. Do you remember what reason they gave for asking for a king? That we might be like the other nations. He would lead us in battle and we might be like the other nations. That is exactly what God did not want them to be like. But they wanted to be like the other nations. So the same applies here. Do not be conformed uh, to this world. Uh, then another principle in the life of a disciple or something related to God's will. It is God's will that we make a wise use of our time. Uh, in the epistles it speaks of redeeming the time because the days are evil. So uh, in yesterday's group discussion we were talking about various things and one of the things that came up was the way in which we use our time. Uh, we have a lot of time uh, but we are wasting most of it. But a disciple of Christ is very conscious that uh, we are only living for a few years and after that is eternity. We have only one life, there is no reincarnation. So you make the best of your own life. You make the best of the time that you have now. You know, today I am 36 years old. I would give anything to have my 20s back, but I cannot have it back. Uh, so another principle, make the best use of your time. Then another principle in the life of a disciple or related to God's will. It is, it is God's will that we worship Him. That's what we do on a Sunday morning and uh, many other occasions. But it is God's will that we worship Him meaningfully. Uh, you remember in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, uh, they were supposed to offer blameless, spotless animals to God for worship, for sacrifices. But uh, in the book of Malachi, we read about blind and lame animals being offering being offered we read of stale bread being offered and sometimes that's what we do in our worship also uh, it's a very passive worship we are not mentally we are not emotionally prepared for worship but we come on a sunday morning and uh, somehow you know the songs are there and we get carried along with that and maybe somebody shares another thought and we get carried with that but uh, on our own inside there's nothing coming out uh, maybe we might say the same words that we said, have been saying for a long time. But that's all stale worship. And that is not the will of God. It's God's will that all disciples worship God meaningfully from the bottom of their hearts. Um, it, it is a very precious thing to know God's will and to be centered in it. Now, so far what I said about God's will was the common will of God for all believers. It's God's will that all of us believers worship Him. It's God's will for all believers that we be not conformed to this world. It's God's will for all of us that we um, make a good use of our time. But there are some aspects of God's will that are different for different believers. What is God's will for you may not be God's will for me. And this thing may not necessarily be written in the Bible. In the Bible it's not written whom should I marry or which job should I take or where should I live? So how do you find the will of God when it comes to these things? The answer is something like this, that we are the disciples and the Lord the Jesus, He is the Master. Now, it is the Master's duty or it is the Master's responsibility to make His will or His desire known to the servant. So the servant need not worry about, the, about that. It's the Master's duty to communicate the will. So don't worry about that. But worry about this, and that is, it is the servant's duty to be in a place of willingness to do God's will, whatever that might be. And that is what we should be concerned with. I'm wondering, you know, which job should I take or whom should I marry? How can I find the will of God? Well, just ask, I should ask myself, am I in that place of surrender where... Uh, I can say that whatever is God's will for me, that's okay with me. I'm going to do it. Then you will have no problem. God will make sure that he will communicate his will to you in some way or the other. Uh, when I was, uh, I got saved in my third year of uh, engineering and it's a four-year course. So uh, after that, uh, in another year's time, I was nearing the end of my B.Tech degree. 
and uh, I was um, thinking about what I should do. For many years before that, uh, I had this desire that I should go to the United States for higher studies. And uh, you know, a lot of people who uh, who are brought, born and brought up in India and then they go to say the U.S. or some other Western country, they usually promise that they will come back, but then they often never come back. Uh, in my case, um, I wasn't even promising to come back. You know, who wants to live in this country? Uh, I wanted to go there and um, I wanted to live there. I wanted to have uh, a good lifestyle and all the other benefits that come with, uh, come with that. And I was trying to ask God, you know, what is his will? And if anyone asked me, uh, what are you going to do after your graduation? I would say, I'm, I'm seeking God's will. And um, I was praying about it, but there was no answer. So I was wondering and wondering. And uh, I thought so much about it. And eventually I uh, convinced myself. I came to the conclusion that it is God's will for me to, uh, go, to go to America and settle down there. And um, that did not happen. Uh, God closed whatever channel I was trying and uh, I ended up in India only and in Mumbai and uh, doing the same job that I'm doing right now and I was one disappointed, depressed Christian. Uh, I was so disappointed at having, you know, being in India and even the job that I was doing, I didn't consider it very glamorous. I mean, when people ask you in church, you know, what is the job that you're doing? and I was training students for entrance exams. That didn't sound like a very nice thing to tell to people, to announce to people. And I was so disappointed and depressed. And this went on for some time. Around two or three years later, once uh, I was uh, sitting in church on a Sunday morning, and uh, on that day, uh, the pastor of the church there, he was uh, preaching about the Great Commission. and. Uh, he was speaking about evangelism, the need for evangelism in India. And, uh, you know, he was saying how in the past, in maybe 100, 200 years back, there were foreign missionaries who used to come, Western missionaries who came here to our country and they shared the gospel. But that time is gone now. They are not allowed in this place anymore. And now it is our duty as Indians to tell our countrymen about the gospel. And there are so many people in India, billions, uh, crores of people who have not even heard the name of Jesus Christ. And how important it is for us believers, Indian believers, to take the gospel to every corner of our country. And when he was speaking all these things, I heard the voice of God speaking to me, saying that it was never my will for you to depart from this country. It was always my will for you to be here only. And uh, when I heard that, uh, I was able to accept it and there was such peace and joy. And later on this question came to me, why didn't God not reveal his will to me earlier when I was graduating and I was asking God what his will is? Why did he not reveal his will at that time to me? And the answer also was obvious to me because I was not having a pure heart. I was not having a single eye. Uh, there were already my own desires filling up my heart and so there was no room for God to speak his will to me. Uh, so the reason for giving this example is to you know, make this point that don't worry about how to find God's will, but worry about this, that are you in a place of surrender where you are willing to take God's will, whatever it is? If so, then he will reveal his will. There will be no problem for you in finding his will. Another characteristic of a disciple is service to other people. And again, we look at our perfect example, the Lord Jesus. Shall we turn to... Mark chapter 6 and verse 31. Yeah. So the Lord Jesus and his disciples were preaching and teaching the people and healing the sick and so on. And there were so many people who were coming to them. They didn't even have time to eat. You know, I'm a person, I like to have my meals at the correct times. You know, uh, some people are not very particular about that. But anyway, these people, they didn't have even time to eat because people were always uh, coming to them. And then read verse 34 also. Yeah. So because they were already overworked, uh, the Lord Jesus said, come away to a desert place. And they went to a remote place trying to get away from the crowd. But the crowd followed them there. And it says that the Lord Jesus was moved with compassion. Because he saw that these are people who do not have spiritual guidance. These are people who are left in the lurch. Uh, they are hanging in the balance there without knowing what is the true way to God. 
uh, their souls were in danger of going to hell. And so the Lord Jesus was moved with compassion. And it says there that he taught them many things. This was the work of all the scribes that were there at that time. They were not doing their work. So the Lord Jesus taught these people many things. So this is just one example. Uh, you know, the gospel of Mark is the gospel in which the servanthood or the labor of the Lord Jesus Christ is brought forth to the maximum amount. So the Lord Jesus was the servant of God and the Lord Jesus was serving others. Uh, in the same gospel, he says that I have not come, to, the son of man has not come to be served, but I have come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Uh, if you, uh, another example, uh, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ came to Jerusalem during the last week near the time of his passion, it says that every morning in the temple he would go there and he would teach the people. And during the nights, it was common for him to spend the night in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives area. Um, so one of the things that strikes us as we read that is that, uh, you know, wasn't there anybody inviting, home, inviting him home to spend the night with them? Um, Sometimes he was at the place of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but perhaps apart from them, there was no other home open to him and he was spending the nights in the garden, outdoors. So he was serving the people during the day, but he was not getting uh, even a basic comfort during the night from them. But still, nevertheless, even when the morning breaks, he would go again to the temple and teach the people. So uh, it's a selfless service that the Lord Jesus did. Uh, at the cross... You remember what the Lord Jesus said to the thief, the repentant thief. This day, verily I say unto you, this day you shall be with me in paradise. So he was serving, he was helping out this thief who had lived an evil life, but now he was, uh, he was confessing and he was repenting of his sins. So Jesus served the repentant thief. Uh, we already referred to the verse where Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of those who crucified him. Then... The Lord also spoke something to the daughters of Jerusalem. You know, they were weeping for him. And then he said, don't weep for me, but weep for y'all and for your children. So he was concerned about the welfare of the children of the citizens of Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus also served his mother on the cross. Do you remember that? He turned to the disciple John and he said, behold your mother. And since after that, John took Mary into his house. So he uh, saw to it that his mother, Mary, was taken proper care of. So what I'm trying to say is, even on the cross, with the nails through his hands and his feet, uh, he was serving others. He was thinking about their benefit and their welfare. If this is what Jesus did, then the same behooves us. See, intuitively, all humans believe that we ought to serve others. You listen to any speech of any principal or teacher in a school or in a college on Independence Day or Republic Day, they will all talk about service. Yeah, we should serve others, we should work for the benefit of society and all that. And the problem that we face is that we don't have enough motivation. You know, the students who are li listening to the principal's speech will say, yeah, it's all well and good to say that, yeah, I should serve society and all that. But honestly, I'm more concerned about my own job and my own career and I've got enough things to worry about on my own. So we don't have the strength and this motivation and we don't have the guidance also, how to serve. Now this is the general problem of human beings. We know that we should serve, but we don't feel motivated, we don't feel strong enough to serve, we don't feel the guidance that is necessary to serve. But all these things are available to a disciple of Jesus Christ. If I'm a disciple, then God will give me the motivation to serve, God will give me the strength to serve, and God will also give me guidance as to exactly in what area I should serve. Uh, thinking of service, the uh, example of uh, William Carey came to my mind. Um, uh, even the government has recognized his uh, service and that's why they released his stamp. Um, probably some of us are aware that William Carey uh, came, I think, in the 1700s from England to India. And uh, the British were not... Uh, they did not like the idea of missionaries because they thought that it would disturb the status quo. So he was, uh, he was in a small part of near West Bengal where, uh, which was occupied by Denmark. And from there he was working. He translated the Bible into many languages. Um, he 
started the first newspaper in the country, savings banks accounts for farmers. He started many schools. Um, when the government of India released a stamp, they also released this picture along with the stamp. So that shows some of the things that William Carey did. Uh, the, some of the textbooks that he wrote, the schools that he founded, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, when uh, William Carey started his school, uh, he, uh, the media f medium of instruction was English. And a lot of uh, people from the uh, Bengal area would come and study. And uh, William Carey realized that these people are coming to study here only because they want a job in the East India Company. They need to know English to get a job in the East India Company. So that's why they're coming and studying here. So William Carey said, that's not my purpose of starting the school. I, I started the school so that Indians can also benefit from all the ideas that have benefited Europe in the last two, three hundred years. So he changed the medium of instruction from English to Bengali because he didn't want just a job to be the motivation. So he wanted Bengali people to learn in their own mother tongue so that it would benefit them the most to learn the scriptures and to learn all the other uh, streams of knowledge that had come up in the Renaissance and, you know, which the Europeans had benefited from. So, great example of service. Uh, William Carey and so many others like him are our legacy and uh, we ought to consider ourselves as people who have taken the baton from them. They have served, they have served their generation and now they're gone. But how are we going to serve our generation and what are we going to leave behind for the generations to come? These are the kind of thoughts that should be there in a disciple of Christ. Then, another principle to be followed by a disciple of Christ. So, another thing of what it means to follow Christ is to abide, to abide in Jesus Christ. So, shall we read, someone, someone could read John chapter 15, verse 4. Yeah. So, here, the Lord Jesus Christ is explaining the relationship between the master and the disciple. So, he is the vine and we are the branches. Now, the branches cannot manufacture fruit. They cannot produce fruit on their own. If you have a branch lying on the ground, nothing grows out of it. But fruit automatically comes on the branches simply because the branches are connected to the vine, the main branch, the stem, the trunk. And uh, so it works in the Christian life. Uh, we cannot make fruit on our own. We cannot produce any results on our own. But if we are connected to the Lord Jesus, if we are abiding in him, then the fruit will be automatically produced in Christ. Now, um, what, what does it mean to abide or how can we abide in Christ? To abide literally means to be close to. So you can be close to someone by spending time with that person. You can be close to someone by knowing that person, what he likes, what he dislikes, what is his character and so on. So how can I abide in Christ? By spending time with him. This means spending time with God's word, spending time in prayer, spending time trying to understand who Christ is, thinking about who he is, what he has done, what's so great about Christ. As we think about these things and in our minds tell ourselves that yes, we ought to live as he lived. We ought to make Jesus, keep Jesus as the Lord of our lives. That is what it means to abide in Christ. And when we abide in Christ, the fruit will come. Now, um, in the last session, I raised this question, you know, what is, the, what is the ultimate aim of everything in this universe? Where is it all headed? And the answer is, it is headed towards the display of God's glory. God's glory is the biggest objective in this universe. Everything that is in conformity with that is going to last. So, the same applies for our discipleship. And it is fruit that glorifies God. We seek fruit, not for fruit's sake. But we seek fruit because fruit glorifies God. Shall we turn to the same chapter, John chapter 15 and verse 8. Yeah, ye shall bear much fruit. So shall my Father be glorified. So glory comes to the Father when we bear fruit. And so shall he be my disciples. The acid test of our discipleship is if we can bear fruit. That's the acid test. You know, is, is my life being used to encourage other believers? Is my life being used to edify believers? Uh, when, when I die and my, and my funeral is being conducted, will there be believers who will be able to stand and say that, yes, this person, you know, he spoke to me, he did this for me, and because of that, my life was impacted and I was changed. 
At my funeral, will there be anyone who stands to say that this person shared the gospel with me? And that is why today I know the Lord Jesus Christ and my eternity is secure. You know, that is called fruit. And that is the acid test of our discipleship. Can we bear fruit? Can we impact others? It's, uh, you know, sometimes I feel in our own church circles, it's very uh, easy uh, to throw our weight around, you know, to be confident, to be smart, to be very assertive. Uh, there's a brother in our church who says like this, you know, some of us, we are lions in the church, but we are mice outside. Can we be that assertive, that vocal about our faith when we are surrounded by unbelievers? Uh, can we be vocal about our faith? The way we worship God here, can we be vocal about our faith in our office? If you're having a conversation with three or four other Hindus or Muslims or atheists, can we be vocal with our faith? You know, uh, this is the quality that is needed to produce fruit. And fruit glorifies God. And by bearing fruit, we shall be his disciples. In connection with fruit bearing, there's one verse which is precious. And uh, we'll read that. Psalm 126 and verse 6. Those who go forth, not just be where you are, those who go forth. And back to weeping. Can God teach us to weep for people who are not like us? As South Indians, can we weep for North Indians who do not know the gospel? Those who go forth weeping and bearing valuable, precious seed that is there for sowing, they will doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. That's a promise that God gives to us. And as disciples, let us seek that we also bear fruit. And let us hold on to this promise that God will use us to bear fruit and so that God will be glorified. You know, why do we preach the gospel to people? One way of answering is so that they don't go to hell. Yeah, that's correct. You know, but there's another bigger purpose or bigger response to that. And that is so that God would get the glory. Right now, God is not getting enough glory from India. There are so few Indians, such a small percentage of Indians who are glorifying the true God. Satan is getting glory from India. It's got to be our desire that God gets the glory. And for that, we should desire fruit. May there be more people, millions of more people who praise God, who stand in honor of the true God. And that ought to be the desire, the heartfelt beat of every disciple. Then another characteristic of a disciple is a love for God's people. Uh, sh uh, shall we read uh, John chapter 13 verse 35 yes there is love between disciples uh, there is a student uh, of mine uh, about three years ago I shared the gospel with her and just recently uh, she got saved and after that she was talking to me and she said like this you know you were my teacher and right from the beginning um, I have always respected you. I have always had respect for you. But now, I also have so much of love for you. Because I realize what a precious thing you have given me in giving me the, giving me the gospel. So when a person gets saved, we are filled with love for those people who have helped us on our way, for other people who have experienced the same love. And this verse that we have read here, it tells us that uh, it is this that will convince others that you are indeed my disciples. I know a person um, who uh, was fellowshipping for a long time with uh, a church. And one day she told one of the elders' wives that, uh, you know, please don't be offended. I'm a Hindu and I'm always going to be a Hindu. I will never become a Christian. It's not my intention to become a Christian, but I'm just coming here to your church because I like your company. I like all of you all. You're a good people. You're a friendly and loving people. And I like your company. That's why I'm coming here. You know, and the elder's wife said, okay, you're most welcome. Don't, uh, don't hesitate. We, we love you unconditionally. And uh, this girl was there for many years. And uh, eventually, you know, her hard heart softened and she committed her life to Christ. Why? One of the things that convinced her was the love that she saw among God's people. There are people who have come to our church and who have said that, 
you know, we have noticed that you all are closely knit, that you people have love one for, one for each other. But so often it happens that there are obstacles to loving people, isn't it? We look at someone else in church who is not like us, does not come from the same background as we are, maybe culturally different, maybe different in terms of language, and we find it difficult to love them. But uh, we ought to always remind ourselves of the love that God has given for us, and then we will have the strength and the motivation to love others as well. Um, the, the Bible has lots to say about love, but uh, right now we'll just look at uh, one particular verse. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7. Yes, love bears all things and believes all things. Um, sometimes as Christians, uh, we are plagued with cynicism. You know, we look at someone doing something and we say, oh, that guy is probably just showing off. Okay. Or we look at someone doing something and say, okay, probably that guy is just trying to please so and so, that's why he's doing it. Now, these things might be true. But what this verse is telling us is that love believes all things. That is, you, you give people the benefit of the doubt. When some Christian says that I'm doing this thing, you know, let us give him the benefit of the doubt. Let us pray for him that he will do it with the right motives. And to the extent that God allows us, let us also participate with it. Um, uh, one of the obstacles that happens in the kingdom of God to work getting done is getting enough people to agree on something. I mean, should we have an outreach campaign somewhere? Okay, how many people will say yes? Not just yes, but okay, I'll also be part of it. Uh, there'll probably be a lot of people who say, yeah, that's fine. I mean, you can go ahead and do it. But love believes all things, trusts that as believers we are working together, working together for God's glory. And may that kind of love characterize us in this assembly and us as all disciples of Jesus Christ, that we can treat every person as a brother or a sister in Christ, that we can work together with them, that we can believe the best about them. Uh, that is love for God's people. Um, when we think of love, always we must remind ourselves that it is because God has loved us so much, only because of that, that we can love others. When I am so overwhelmed, when I am so conscious of God's love, then it is possible for me to love others. You know, otherwise, uh, naturally speaking, it's just not possible for us to love people who are different from us. So. Uh, we started by reading Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, where the Lord Jesus said, If anyone wants to be my disciple, he should deny himself, take up his cross, and he should follow me. And today we were meditating on what does it mean to follow God? Or what does it mean to live like Christ? So the first thing we considered was obedience to God's word. The Lord Jesus valued and treasured and knew and obeyed God's word. And as disciples, we also should. And uh, we, are, we are living 2,000 years after Christ. And if you look at these 2,000 years, it's such an amazing story of how God has used different people in history to preserve and to transmit and to translate God's word. And we must have respect for them and we must value what they have given to us and also pass it on to others. That's obedience to, the, to God's word. Then we spoke, uh, we spoke of living in the power of the Holy Spirit, being guided by the Holy Spirit, operating in his power, not in our own flesh, and being guided by the will of God rather than our own desires. And we saw that this is necessary in order to really do what we are called to do. We are called to do supernatural stuff. So unless we are doing it in the will of God, unless we are doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, it is not going to get accomplished. Then we also saw that there are some parts or aspects of God's will that are the same for all believers, separation from the world, worship, Redeeming your time. These are the same things for everyone. But there are other things which are different for different people. You won't find it directly written in the Bible. But if your heart is ready to obey God, then he will definitely communicate his will to us. And then we looked at unselfish service for others. The Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant. And uh, we are also called to be, those, uh, be, be servants like him, taking his motivation. Then another char characteristic of a disciple is that he abides in Christ. Uh, we don't operate on our own, but we stick close to Christ and he lives through us. And then as he lives through us, the fruit is accomplished. 
whether it's the fruit of righteous living, whether it's the fruit of uh, uh, edifying others in the church, whether it's the fruit of winning people to Christ, all these fruit are accomplished in our lives as Christ lives through us when we abide in him. And then we saw love for God's people. The Lord Jesus loved us the way he loved the Father. Usually when you have a closely knit group, they don't like anyone else coming in. They don't like intruders. But in the Trinity, you have a very closely knit group and they have welcomed us. Jesus says, I have loved you the way my Father has loved me. And he calls us to love each other with the same love. And it is possible for us to love only because we've been first loved by Christ.